He is a wonder of the world. Boundless energy and enthusiasm. It's a 24-7 job for him. Free throws, let's go! Free throws! Free throws! He's famous? Yeah, he's a music critic. Really? Yeah, so he writes. You know, even the parents, who I've, some of whom, their, their kids I've coached for a year or two, finally put it together. Like, oh yeah, you're that guy in the paper that writes the music column? We're part of the class that came into the field right after Woodward and Bernstein. So there was a real passion for reporting and serious news. And Greg easily could have been a very serious news reporter. Um, I love newspapers. I wanted to work at a newspaper. I didn't think I would ever be a full-time. I, I, it wasn't like on my radar that I was going to be a full-time music critic at a major daily newspaper. Although I think if somebody had asked me, like, what would your wildest dreams be, that probably would have been. tell him, you know, he could be a rock critic until he's 70, and I think he would knock the socks off anyone in their 20s or 30s. I go to South by Southwest with him every year, and he ends up um, outdoing me every year when I'm half his age. Don't really work from here that, that much, frankly. It's a place where I get a lot of my mail, but in terms of the actual work, it's, it's done back home. And I got some of my stuff out here, vinyl on this side, books on this side, office in here. I probably do, um, you know, two, three, four interviews a week from this office. So I'm talking to everybody from, you know, I've gotten calls on that phone from Mick Jagger and Bono and uh, Eddie Vedder to interviewing a new band. He is the most open-minded listener I know, especially for somebody his age. When you're in your 20s, early 30s, it's very easy to be open-minded about kinds of music. When you're, let's say, zeroing in on 60, it's a different matter, and you'll find that a lot of critics kind of get ossified. In terms of what I like about the job is that I knew, know that I'm gonna learn, learn something new every day. It's not the same job. Pop culture, pop music is always teaching me something about us as a, as a people. You know, it sounds pretentious, but music is us talking to ourselves you know, in, a, in the most immediate fashion possible. Of all the art forms, music is the most immediate, and that's why I love covering it as a, as a beat. Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. Black, white, woman, or man, everybody's a star, and everybody should be themselves. Sly Stone not only wrote those words, he lived them. I'm Jim DeRogatis. And I'm Greg Cott. We speak with Cynthia Robinson and Jerry Martini, founding members of the Family Stone. Plus, Jim and I review this year's Oscar-nominated songs and review a new album by alt-country singer Lydia Lovelace. That's all coming up on Sound Opinions. Sound Opinions is a nationally distributed public radio program and podcast. Um, we're also events and a website uh, all about music. It's two guys basically sitting around in their living room talking about music they love and with the idea that the third party on the couch is the listener. It's an absurdly uh, fun thing to do. It's ridiculous that we get away with doing it for a hundred some odd stations across the country and uh, uh, have been doing it for a long time. Fergus Lang, he works so hard, as busy as if he is. Fergus Lang has 17 friends, all as dull as he is. The 17 friends of 17 wives, all the perfect shape and size. They wipe their tails and bat their eyes, just like Lassie. Well, you know, I have to say I don't really get nervous anymore uh, interviewing anybody. Um, I think there was a little bit of starstruck, you know, when you start doing this job, but after a while you just realize they're normal people. For me, it's about over-preparing for everything. You know, like with Richard Thompson, you want to know his career backward and forward. Of course, we both do because we've been writing about his music for so long. Greg lacks a certain cynicism that drives you a little crazy in this business. Um, after a while, you get jaded, 
and he has somehow insulated himself away from being jaded and cynical. You've got to have something else in your life. I think for Greg, it's it's family. You know, his daughters and, and his wife, Deb, are incredibly important to him. And I think it's basketball. I think, for me, it's more of a release. It's kind of like this is completely opposite from what I do during my day job. I'm talking to adults all the time or, you know, people, rock stars, who can be as adult as they want or not want not to be. The Staple Singers became free agents at a time when black music was flourishing on the South Side, with gospel, blues, and doo-wop on the ascent, and soul rumbling to life. Pops and the family were coveted by the largest black-owned record company in the country, VJ, the core of Chicago's record row on South Michigan Avenue, along with Chess Records. Well, the Staple Singers are a one-of-a-kind story. I think they cover such a wide swath of American history just through the lens of that particular family that it was a story in itself. It's, it's a, a, a really kind of a history of the African-American community over the last hundred years. And this family happened to be, you know, right in the doorway for a lot of what happened. I think he found a bigger subject with the Mavis Staples book. You know, he found something he can write passionately about a kind of music that a lot of us didn't know the backstory of, but also connect it to a bigger story of civil rights and history in America. You know, it's, to me, it's not just a music biography. We began to talk about the condition of the world and our people, Pop said. I said to him, Dr. King, you preach love, peace, and happiness all over the world. I strongly believe in what you're doing and the price you're willing to pay. King was familiar with the Staples singers, and he saw a reflection of his values not only in the music the Staples performed, but in the way Pops, in particular, spoke and carried himself. I hope there are layers to it for the reader to uncover, so that it's, as you're reading it, you're, you're not only getting a story of a person's life or a, a group's life together, their career, but about uh, the culture. I said that what I like about the book is that it's layered. So it mentions basically not only, not only the music, not only gospel, um, different genres that Mavis was in, but also a lot of historical context. The migration to Chicago, the uh, popularity here of the rise of soul music, Stax, Memphis, and, and all of that. The music's great, love the music, written many, many articles about it in the Chicago Tribune and elsewhere. But what made me want to write the book was the bigger story that you could tell through that music. From my perspective as a professor, most teachable um, in a course like the rock and roll class where I have people who um, don't know very, who know very little about rock and roll and others of course who believe they know it all um, and, and so I have to find books that kind of, you know, you know reach uh, both audiences. This is a book that will accomplish that. So I'm, so selfishly, I see that book as a particularly valuable contribution that, uh, you know, that Greg has offered to us. That was the main um, idea, is to do a story in depth, do it well, tell it the way it needs to be told. And uh, for, as I said, for a journalist, that's, that's kind of the ultimate. And uh, you know, as, uh, once you do one, you want to do more. It's almost a right brain, left brain kind of thing, like, you know, how are you doing this and that as well. He's a great person, he's a good father, um, he's a sports junkie too, and you don't always find people who are both sports junkies and music junkies like he is, and, and it, it's gratifying to see him get recognition for the good work he does. Well, I think that enthusiasm and that appetite is actually pretty unique. I think music criticism, like any other criticism, uh, lends itself to being burnt out really quickly. He is kind of the absent-minded professor, you know, sometimes. I mean, you know, when we were, and, and sometimes the gaps in his knowledge astound me. Um, I mean, like the fact that he didn't know what Despicable Me was, right? I mean, he really literally doesn't, because he gets really kind of tunnel vision focused, you know, and, and also, you know, he's, 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 Coach Cod is pretty uptight, you know. He's able to separate the artifice of the music business from the music, and um, his, his love of the music really sort of helps him become one of the upper echelon critics in the business. I guess what I'm most impressed with is that for, you know, a, a guy in his mid-50s, he's, you know, he's, he's so current. Even as a student at Marquette, um, I mean, he had ambitions. And um, 
and and uh, and I appreciated that. I mean, he really wanted to do something with uh, with with journalism and, and with music, and and he has. The variety is, is is a big part of it. You know, just the fact that it's it's changing every day. So you're a feature writer, you're a news reporter, you're a critic. And you're constantly changing. You know, those, those roles are constantly rotating during the during the course of any day. So that's what's great about it. You're not doing the same thing every day.